This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception in Action podcast, my interview with Mark O'Sullivan, coach with AIK Football in Stockholm. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Mark O'Sullivan. Mark is originally from Cork City in Ireland and now lives in Stockholm where he coaches with AIK. He also does a lot of work related to coach education. In the interview, we discuss Mark's concept of football interactions and how it relates to practice design and affordances, and the problem of the race to the bottom in talent identification. Hope you enjoy! Today, my guest is Marco Sullivan, coach with AIK in Stockholm. Thanks for taking some time to join me, Mark. Thank you very much. It's uh, an absolute honor with all the great uh, people you've already on, had on. Uh, some of them are real heroes of mine. Thank you. Yeah. And so to kick off things, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up in <laughs> Stockholm? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm originally from Cork City in Ireland. I had a, a multi-sport childhood like all kids in the 70s and 80s did, early 80s did. We, you know, played lots of sports out on the street, hurling, which is the Irish sport, Gaelic football, soccer, rugby, everything. I also then had a parallel passion, which was music. So ran through my family. Everyone was interested in basically music and sport ran our family. I played, I managed to play a few just before I went to college, a, a few games at the top level in Ireland and then played with the college team, which was a, probably a level down. But also I was kind of, you know, playing music as well at the same time. So my whole life is kind of this music form of life and this sport form of life have somehow combined and guided me or misguided me depends on how you look at it um and then i studied computer science and economics in university and then i think it was in 1994 i went to stockholm to visit some friends i studied with in university for three weeks and i'm still here <laughs> nice <laughs> yeah kind of in that time i i actually was working a lot of music um running record labels house dj techno dj reggae dub producer Travel, I traveled around a lot. I've, you know, been over year way playing as well, everywhere from Tokyo to Montreal to Barcelona. So did that for a few years, but also in the background, I had with some friends started a football club and, uh, of expats, Irish and English. And suddenly then eventually within two years, that football club was made up of about 40 different nationalities. And we started progressing up the Swedish league. And as we were doing that, another uh, guy in the club asked me, would I come and help his, this is about 12 years ago, 10 years ago, would I help a youth team he was coaching? So I said, yeah, I'll help out. And he jumped off after three weeks, leaving me on my own. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, what do I do? So that's when this kind of fascinating journey began into the music started fading, fading out, as we say. And mm -hmm. the, I just became completely obsessed with learning and sport. Oh, great. Can you tell us a little bit kind of your coaching philosophy and, and maybe how it's evolved? Yeah, over well, that time? The, the coach, well, yeah, it's how it's emerged or evolved. I mm -hmm. think. I can give you two real watershed moments, possibly. One was I was down eight years ago down with our city, Espanol, mm -hmm. the Liga club in uh, Barcelona. Really, really f fantastic coaches working there. And I was working with them in their academy. And I had some partnership going with them between them and St Stockholm and Barcelona. And I must have been really annoying to coach your questions because he left and came back with loads of papers. And he said, you need to read these. <laughs> and it was all based around kind of game sense, teaching games to understanding ideas of constraints led, constraints led approach, just uh, papers around that. And it just went, Oh my God. I went, <laughs> Oh wow. So this kind of frustration that I was feeling where I had real difficulty putting words and what I was thinking. And it, it really started to give me a vocabulary mm -hmm. to start working with. And, uh, and then of course, I think the we learn mostly possibly from the mistakes we make in the training. There was a this is eight years ago again. Some kid I was working with in, in a team, and he's amazing. One week in training, the next week he's all over the place, giving the ball away to the opponents, and then next week he's amazing again. And this is going on for months, and I'm getting really irritated because I'm doing everything right, obviously, as I'm the coach, <laughs> and uh, 
I, I pull him aside and I say, hey, you know, what? you've just given the ball away continuously, you know. And he said, Mark, I'm colorblind. And I went, oh, wow. So it all depended on the vests. The oh. color of the vests was very defining in how he performed in training. And that, of course, is a, was a serious lesson that it's, you know, there's, there's other things going on too yes. <laughs> in these young people's lives. Yes. Yeah. So, um, that, that kind of, these events set me off. So I would say I'd have to start positioning myself now. I would be, if you look at a Venn diagram, uh, where one circle is the practical and the other is the academical. I occupy that space in the middle where the cross section is. That's where I stand looking both ways. And I'm hoping that this middle sec, my aim is to get that middle section to be much bigger. So I'm say I'm grounding my, my coaching ideas around player development within a much broader ecological context. And the, the fact that humans are not systems that behave like machines. And I see it more as navigating complexity if you look at the game everyone says the game is simple yes the game is simple my game football soccer mm -hmm. it is simple yeah we score more you score more goals the opposition you win but really it's a quite a complex sport so it's like a continuum of complexity the game itself and then the culture around it is extremely complex as you know if you read the international olympic committee consensus report there from i think it's 2014 or 15 and they, they speak about the complexity of the whole culture around childhood sport that it's been so media centered very adult driven, uh, very, and it's creating a lot of stress for a lot of these young people. Then, of course, learning. Yeah, that's, that's fairly complex, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and my idea as a coach, if I'm stepping into the learning process, I better add value. And to give an example of that, I was doing a coach education course. I looked out the window at a brain, and there was a bunch of seven year olds running onto the pitch. And they had a load of footballs and they broke in a 2v2, 3v3 game, 1v1s. And I was just watching them going, wow, this is amazing. This is, this is like the Champions League final, or the World Cup final. They're, they're really into this. And then the coaches turn up and what do you think happens? They blow a whistle <laughs> and they organize it. And the question I would ask the coaches, did you add value? Mm -hmm. So, and I think if you look at my philosophy, key part of my philosophy is helping players develop and understand, uh, a better understanding in the game as opposed to just up the game. So, yeah, I'm spending less time in the repetition, rehearsal, drilling end of the landscape and more in the rich fields, at the variable end. That's a really great description. And that this is kind of culminated in, in a recent thing that you've been talking about, I know, on your blog and other places, the, the idea of football interactions. Can yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, this concept idea has been something that's been inside my head for a while because I do some coach education uh, in, in in Stockholm, uh, delivering the Swedish FA first two levels of coach education. And despite the, the, the curriculum itself is quite holistic, it looks at the broader perspective of child youth development. But when it comes to the actual training, people still, when they hear the word action, they just, despite the fact that we try and it's been introduced as it's not just a biomechanical action, there's other stuff going on that influences this. There's a, like the psychology, the physiology, the, the game insight, etc., all mixed into one, that people still are falling back on their old method of the biomechanical action as in, yeah, well, I'm going to teach you how to dribble. This is the right way to dribble and this is the right way to pass a ball. You, or you put your foot in the ground like this and you open up this thing, foot this way and, you know, so it, and I'm just kind of going, why is this? Despite, so I started using the word with my work, football interactions. And what, what I mean by that is that I, I want to challenge this coaching cultures that separate the player and the environment system that seems to have very much found its way into the fabric of organized child sports. So football interactions are dribble, pass, running off the ball, tackling, closing space, whatever, everything that happens. And they're like the, the interactions between the parts of, of us, all the systems. They are situational, contextual, cultural, and historical. Now, historical in the sense that if you two eight-year-olds that turn up your training for a session, uh, one lives on the 20th floor in a apartment block, single mother, uh, doesn't have much time, works a lot, so the child is at home a lot, and the other kid, kid lives on the bottom floor, both parents, older siblings, he's out in the back garden playing football and they a lot. They both turn up with completely different bibliographies of experiences and of uh, movement skills and completely different opportunities to learn these skills. And this is a way that the football interaction, I'm trying to get used to that they're historical as well. 
So it's a combination and interaction of elements that participate in co-creating what is happening. So they are how basically how how players use utilize the information and the environment, or how I say how football like directions how players utilize the affordances in the environment. Mm-hmm. So this idea of again of football interactions, they're tuned by environmental information to function specifically in each unique situation. And it emphasizes that dribbling and passing and all this, there is a need to understand the nature of the information that constrains this movement. And I guess this is what we're going then, uh, we're starting uh, touching on educating the attention of the young player, but also football interactions, educating the attention of the coach. Mm-hmm. Which is very overlooked, I think, as well, because where does the coach look at? He just looks at the person on the ball continuously and focuses probably on the biomechanic, not really looking at the the outcome of the action, which is quite quite important. Yeah. So, for instance, if if you look at decision making possibilities of the player in possession, that is mainly determined by the quality and state of positioning of teammates and opponents, and of course, location on the pitch, not the actual biomechanical technique itself. So that's kind of football interactions it's about also educating the coach's attention yeah no i think that makes a lot of sense and i like that so do you kind of use the interaction and replacement for technique or skill yeah well yeah because this technique skill debate is is just causing lots of (laughs) yeah lots of debates (laughs) even more polarization and i'm just trying to say you know when you pass a ball you're interacting with a system with the environment it's an interaction and you pass the ball with respect you're interacting with respect you dribble every everything you do is in interaction with the environment and it kind of changes and affects the environment and influences in some way. Yeah, I agree. You can't take it out of the context exactly, yeah. or it's not a pat, like a pass has a purpose. <laughs> it's not just hitting yeah. a ball, like, uh, you know, it has a purpose to get to someone. So you, you have to have the someone in the definition of it. So, so you mentioned yeah. that the kind of the affordances and, and I guess so. To kind of facilitate these interactions, I'm guessing, you know, you mentioned earlier the constraints that approach. Is that kind of one of the ways? Yeah. That, yeah. So can, can you give us an example of maybe how you how you do that in practice? Kind of how you develop these interactions? In practice? Yeah. I did some stuff on my blog uh, about this. And there was one where it's about, of course, we're, we were speaking what are affordances, well, opportunities for action presented in our social cultural practices and you know, the Reit Vilkiva scene. I really like their uh, work on affordances. And these are related to each individual's ability to use this available information. And I think that's quite, quite a rich way of looking at, um, learning environments. And, if, and, and the players means to, uh, football directors, the players means to utilize these affordances. Now, you can look at affordances, say, two defenders coming at the, at the person in possession. Now, for a player like Lionel Messi, this gap that he sees, might afford him because of his capabilities dribbling through, you know, running through with great speed with the ball, fooling both. Or for another player like, say, Iniesta in Barcelona, or Xavi used to play Barcelona, this gap of two defenders affords maybe passing through for him. Mm-hmm. So even though it's, just, it's the, the affordance of this gap offers different opportunities depending on their capabilities. And this is kind of important when we're working with kids because when, when I work with young kids in design environments, my focus is, is not on this kind of race to get them better. It's about optimizing their abilities now. And I think the beauty with football is that you can have a player like Lionel Messi, who's quite small, or a player like Zlatan Vivaham, which is quite huge, but they're both different bodily structures, completely different builds and everything, but they've both learned to optimize their abilities and we kind of forget this in child youth sport, mm-hmm. I think, in some way. We, we don't, we don't see, you know, we don't design environments to optimize each individual's ability. So to design like environments, what I call deliberately designing environment that's compatible with the action capabilities of young learners. Like an example, let's say with kids, very young kids now will say like eight, nine, it's very common to hear them. They say things like, Oh, you know, you got to spread out. You got to, you got to have depth. You got to have width. Mm-hmm. And really to kids that age, it's the words depth and width is kind of, well, what is that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you know, I, I kind of take it from the sense that you can design a game. You can have different size spaces with different n- number of players and the game. Then as they're working, you can just say, okay, is it hard to defend a bigger space or a small space? And as you, as the game goes, an answer kind of emerges as, Hey, you know, it's hard. It's, it's harder to defend a bigger space. Okay. What does that mean when you have the ball? And you, so let's try and challenge this. 
that it's hard to defend a bigger space when you have the ball. What does that mean? And it's when you see these the young players moving away from the player with the ball, their teammate with the ball, that's when you kind of see things happening. Because they're attracted to the ball. They want to be there. They want to be near the ball. They, you know, if you're, if you tell a kid move away from the ball, he's going to think you're mad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want the ball. But if you give value to it, because it's hard, harder for the opposition to get the ball, they, they move away. And, and then that develops these, this, this space to create a, which unknown to them, this width and depth possibly, a fo- creates affordances of, of passing, of dribbling, gaps start emerging. Mm-hmm. That's when you can may I go in and maybe say, okay, what well, what is a gap in this game? Can 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 you tell me what it is? And it can be. And I, I did this with was it eight year olds last week, and it was really cool, you know. After a while, yeah, it's between two players. <laughs> okay, or, and then it goes, but it can also be between a player and the sideline. Yeah, you know, and it's really cool. And so what you do? I can kick the ball through it, or I can run through it, or I can with the ball and or shoot. Good. Let let's see, you know. And then so. While doing this, their attention has been educated. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're creating this rich landscape of affordances in your training, and you haven't really done much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you I know, think... and that it's kind of like this is how I, I work. You know. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I think that's a point that gets missed sometimes. You know, there can be like explicit instruction to to point yeah. people to what the affordances are. Like the difference is though, you're not giving them rules right if the gap no, is no, this no. big pass here um yeah, you know, no, exactly, or place yeah. to run you're just pointing them this is what you might want to base your <laughs> your movement on you know so but letting them figure it out come up with their own solution right and, yeah exactly and, and the thing is that you are creating a forward into the game because their behaviors act themselves are creating these possibilities for into football interaction it's different ones to dribble, to pass, to drive, to shoot, or whatever. And this is, you know, you I mean, you can just build on this as you go along, and it's it's quite a rich way of working, I think, for me anyway. It is, and it, it puts greater demands on me as a coach and on other coaches that I work with because they have to be really top observers because because it's also educating my attention or the coach's attention. You're right, like you said, away from the watching the mechanics of the, the each player exactly to, yeah. to try to understand the. The, the bigger picture, I guess. Oh, also, sorry, this is quite in line with nonlinear pedagogy as well. Mm-hmm. The, the principles which you've also touched on as well, which which actually underpin the practice as well. So you see, so. kind of, there's, you're not going through specific stages of, of no. learning and expecting the kind of this continuous <laughs> monotonic I mean, improvement. And, and yeah. as you, yeah, exactly. And as you touched in your work on Bernstein, there is, you know, one of the principles you have is repetition without repetition. There is, you know, and there is, it's representative learning design, repetition without repetition, perception action is being coupled. We're trying to promote an external focus of attention. And they, they're the guiding principles around the practice. So if you did have a you know group of kids that are crowding around the ball and and, and you know kind mm-hmm. of what would a practice design you would use to try to get them to change that certain constraints that you would put in or other than just telling them don't do it in ways <laughs> don't you can you can no. encourage that space well it, well it is back to this thing is it mm-hmm. hey guys is it what I I did um something last night was very with some eight year olds and I made a big space with three v one in a huge area. Mm-hmm. And then I made kind of a 6v1 in an extremely tiny area. And I just said to them, okay, which, which, which do you prefer playing with when you have the ball? And they all pointed at a big 3v1. I said, but that's 3v1. Here is 6v1 in a small area. And, and, and then one can say, yeah, but there's more space over there. Aha. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, guys. Okay. And what does that mean though? Why oh, there's more space to play football? Why? Because we're not all, t- there's more space between us and the guy, the defender has to cover more ground. Aha. Uh-huh. Can we take this into a game, you think? Yeah, I don't know, whatever people call this. I don't know how people, <laughs> would yeah. work. But again, again, you know, it, it's just a game. For me, I try to create a game or a situation that simulates the game and where there is some sort of feedback comes from the game to the player themselves. And when you see these moments happening, that's when you can start building on it. So there's kind of feedback coming from the game first. Yeah, and trying to isolate, you know, situations that are, mm. hard, you know, in the full game are sometimes are hard to to learn these things, right? There's the spacing's mm. harder exactly. to take advantage of. There's, you know, there's less room, and, and I guess with the, with the individual, do you see 
I guess you have to do these kind of things differently when you're a kid that struggles yeah. a bit with ball handling versus. Yeah, but of course. And, yeah. You know, I, what's wonderful with kids these ages is that, you know, you have these debates about ball manipulation, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Oh, we have to teach them ball manipulation. We have to, and then we've got to say, yeah, but I have, to, I have to understand there. Do the outside of your foot, the inside of your foot. Now you're left. Now you're right. And you know, I have, de- I've done this with so many kids and filmed it. And I've done a game, a game of uh, tag where say six kids have a ball and two kids t- are try to tag them. And what it is then when they tag them, then they take the ball and the other kids become the tag. And suddenly, if you film this, <laughs> you watch it. The kids are using left foot, right foot, inside and outside, change inside a foot, outside a foot, change direction without even thinking of it because the, to survive in that environment, this behavior is demanded of you. Mm-hmm. And they don't, they just do it implicitly. So that's quite a big thing to take home. I think the environment in some way you can also dr- drag out this behavior instead of explicitly telling a kid, use the right foot, use the left foot, use the outside, use the inside. Yeah, I really love those tag drills I've seen. I think I saw one, you have another one where you, kinda, yeah, yeah. Where you yeah. have two one, one on one, right? Where they both have a yeah. ball. Yeah, I love those because the, the kids have their eyes up. And exactly, they're, they're and basing, the focus of attention. Yeah, yeah, they're basing their deci- their, their movements, whether I yeah. go left or right, based on the body, <laughs> so that the perceptual information from the game they'll be in the game. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, and that's that's extraordinarily important. Yeah, I've done that myself. Uh, when people have asked for my opinion <laughs> while I'm watching practice, so I'm like, get rid of the cones and suggest the tag I, drill. I, and what and what I fi- I'm starting to learn myself about these types of designs is that. Okay, it helps learners educate their attention by because they it improves helps them improve how they detect key information, but it also helps helps them to minimize the information they need to regulate their movement as well. So it's that's really quite fascinating, I think, t- to watch over over a few months. Yeah, yeah. really fascinating. Yeah, kind of have to push them a bit. Yeah, to, we're really good at doing stuff without vision all the time. If you push yeah. us a bit, yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah. I guess the the other you know main area I wanted to talk to you about is you know we've been talking about training kids. It's, it's kind of this talent ID and development issue. And mm. you had a really good post uh, a few weeks ago. I guess you called it the race to the bottom, right? This kind of what yeah. what what's going wrong <laughs> with this process. So, can you tell us a little bit about kind of your thoughts on that? First, I wrote a blog about a year ago uh, entitled The Race to the Bottom. And it was when um, it was a club in England were advertising trials for under fives. And not only that, they were asking parents to fill in a form what position their child played in. And when you consider I have a five year old and his favorite position is in the middle of a load of Lego, <laughs> I found I found this like incredible. And I said, are, are we going there? And I, I put something up on Twitter and then guys said, oh, you know, other clubs are doing it. And I was like thinking, wait a minute, just because other clubs are doing it, you think you can do it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I, it inspired me to write this thing about the race to the bottom, that there is this incredible, it's like an arms race, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, to, to younger and younger and younger. And I really don't know where this comes from, you know? It's a totally, you know, basically we can't predict the future. We know this and... It seems to be based on this kind of early specialization thing or, or, you know, you have to start early as possible to do these things. We have kids who still believe in Santa Claus going on trials for clubs, you know, and it's I just can't I can't relate to this at all. I, I just think it's probably the most stupidest thing ever in, in child youth sports. It's completely ignoring. It's very irresponsible. It, yeah, it's yeah, it's da- dangerous in many ways, and it's ignoring the. F- we can't even predict who's going to be an elite when they're twenty. <laughs> what? Why would you but, think we can do it when know, they're six? I don't, you know. Exactly. You know, it's like it's. It, I, I use it. It's like it's like just basically they're doing talent identification. So what they're doing is just putting a load of eggs into a bag, throwing the bag at the wall, taking the egg out that does that doesn't break, and say, "Look, our system works." Yes. You know, it's like, and as you know, talent. You know. Thing about talent is the it's the graveyard of evidence. Nobody looks at the dead bodies. Mm-hmm. So I just and I wrote I was writing about this and I wrote it from like what are parents thinking? Because when a club answers, everyone else is doing this. When a club says, "Oh, we have to do it, or otherwise somebody else will take these five year olds," I'm just thinking, what are the parents thinking? 
I've experienced it when I was in the UK when we did uh, studies with kids with soccer. The easiest consent thing I've ever got. We could have said we were doing anything, and I think the parents would have signed the forms. As yeah. long as we said it was going to help the kids be improve in some way, I think they would have signed off on almost anything. It was it's ridiculous. It's uh, and that's what I like about in Sweden at the moment. And you know we're far from per- perfect. We our our youth sport is is very influenced by this kind of form of life, this neoliberalist form of life that has that's really impinged on youth sport. But our main motto here at the moment and what we're trying to work with is as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible. Keep the player pool open. That's quite central to the vision I have as well. Yeah, no, I think it's an important message. And I think I like that we're trying to get, like for a long time, we are kind of giving, I think, people a lot of mixed messages. Like we're Mm. telling them it's bad to specialize really young but the key to being successful in sports is specificity of training, yeah. <laughs> right? So, but I I like that we're now trying to do like specific alternatives, like some of the stuff like Keith and David's in his group, their yeah. new, their new book where they're talking well, about donor no, sports. Oh yeah, and I can't wait. Well, Keith's actually I've um, started a PhD now with Keith. Oh, I have. So he's yeah, him and um, Ian Renshaw are my um, my uh, Swedish word is handle. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I've forgotten the English word. <laughs> 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 they, they're my supervisors, supervisors that's it yeah, yeah. supervisor handle the other yeah. in swedish no uh, so they're my supervisors so i'm going to go up to them now next week and i'm going to i'm going to give a talk on talent development in, in university too so i look forward to being around him for a week he's quite a unique man yeah. he has this incredible ability to say four words to me after i speak for 10 minutes and i go <laughs> okay that really makes far more sense than i've ever made <laughs> Yeah, I've been there, yeah. Do you, do you know what you're going to be doing for your PhD yet? In- yes, basically it's around designing learning environments and in, in, I guess you could say devi- designing learning environments in 21st century child sport. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of looking at the whole um, social cultural context as well, like the whole form of life that is being impinging on childhood sports, creating all these, like the race to the bottom being one example, these ideas around early talent id and etc and you know kids born early in the year being selected but how can we design learning environments that deals with these um this the complexity and non-linearity of human development so i guess it's really it's kind of defining a guiding theoretical framework for as many as possible as long as possible as good as possible i'm trying to develop a, kind of an ecological framework for the aims of as many as possible as long as possible as good as possible yeah, that's a big topic. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a huge. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a huge topic. Maybe. But uh, I kind of how I'm pinning it down into the pedagogy, the learning environment, but that we have an understanding of the macro as well. That it's very important for coaches that when they're working out on the practice fields, that they have a there is an understanding of the of the of the macro environment too. Yeah, uh, not just not just the the micro. We've gone so micro now. After going so micro of isolating everything down to just biomechanical movements, mm-hmm. you know, it's. I think that we need need to. It's very important. Coaches have have a good understanding of, of macro. I think as well. Yeah, no, I agree, and I I think we've all accepted that. You know, if you if you believe in the complexity and the nonlinear nature, then it's not going to be easy, right? No, uh, that, all, we can't. That's not. Yeah, we can't fall back on the old ways we did research and. Uh, yeah, and yeah. you know this this thing with like the the underlying theoretical framework which you've brought up yourself on many of your podcasts, ecological dynamics. This this helps us account for human development at sociocultural, the macro form of life, and this inf- helps us then further informs us of the sporting skill in, in the microenvironments, which kind of fits nicely in with football interactions then, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I haven't really talked about it much, but there's definitely, I think Noel talks about this a lot, like longer yeah. term constraints on us, uh, developmental yeah. constraints. So it all fits in, uh, I think, nicely. It's just where we, you're right, we usually narrow down on the constraints in the moment kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. that's that story I told you about the two kids that turn up at training, completely different backgrounds, different possibilities for action, different bibliography of movement skills. But that doesn't disregard the potential mm-hmm. of, of, of one of the kids, you know, which is often happens in the race to the bottom. It's the kid 
that lives in the bottom floor with the older siblings. Oh, he's a he's a real talent. We can take him while the other kid, his best mate, who lives upstairs, is hardly ever out because the mother works a lot and is a single mother and doesn't have the opportunity to bring her child out. Then we ignore that kid. That sounds really interesting. And yeah, I agree with you. This, the, the exciting part about it for me is the ecological dynamics and constraints gives a, like you said, a principled framework. <laughs> we all know, yeah. everyone's known this stuff's important for a long time, yeah. but we just didn't have a good way of describing it and thematically investigating it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in my PhD, I'm kind of hoping, if Keith's listening, <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the idea of an ecological dynamics framework underpinning it will, will give me permission to even though my work is focused on the pedagogical, the, the deliberate learning design, that it gives me permission to also, you know, go out a bit into the macro and then come back in again. It's a balance thing, you know. No, that that sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's great to hear you're you're taking that on. You're going to keep coaching and stuff while you while you. Yeah, do. well, yeah. actually, basically, it is my work in coaching that is. It's kind of I'm embedded in in my PhD. Oh, good. Yeah, I think that I'm in the mid. I'm in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's a really good way to do it as well. And so on the front lines, <laughs> so to speak. This has been great, Mark. I really appreciate oh, you taking some you. time to talk with me. It's been a fantastic honor, and as I said, that I have been listening to your podcast for for so much now. It's I could have done this whole interview just asking you to reference different <laughs> different podcasts you've done instead of me talking because you know, you, it's very inspirational for many of us, especially my friends here in AIK, Dennis Hortine and James Vaughn, who I work with. We're very inspired by um, your podcasts and I think you should, hopefully you will keep doing it and pushing things. That's the plan. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Thanks again for the great discussion, Mark. Really look forward to seeing the work coming out of your PhD. You can find a link to Mark's great blog and his Twitter handle in the show notes. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.